Now I'll start working out some examples of these unitary groups. We can take our general definition and start looking at the cases of different dimensions. So let's start with the group U1, the one-dimensional unitary group. Now if you just briefly cast your mind back to the orthogonal groups, we kind of started with the orthogonal group O2 because the group O1 is basically so trivial it's just essentially a real line. We never really bother considering it as a, a lead group and we just start at O2. So the group U1 is of course the one dimensional unitary group. We're just going to be expecting one free parameter but now we need to realize that this is one complex parameter and so a one dimensional complex parameter is really going to actually correspond to two real parameters. So we're going to see shortly that this one dimensional unitary group is somehow related to the two dimensional orthogonal group. We'll see that shortly, but for now let's just start considering this unitary group. So any element now in this one dimensional unitary group is going to have to satisfy the following condition. And now what we need to remember is that this M is basically now just a one by one matrix or just a complex number. And so rather than calling it M so we don't get confused, I'm just going to call it Z since it is just a single complex number. And then you can quite easily show or just simply realize that to satisfy this condition, well, if we remember that we can express now arbitrary complex numbers using our kind of exponential notation where we would give some modulus and then some argument. This now corresponds to the complex number z which is at a distance r from the origin with polar coordinate theta essentially. So this diagram drawn here is the complex plane this is the real part of Z imaginary. So hopefully you've seen this exponential representation for complex numbers before. This is basically using the de Moivre theorem or just Taylor's expansion to express this e to the i theta as the following. You can just prove this by Taylor expanding and then we realize that this is really now just giving the x and y coordinates of this point z. And so this is a perfectly good way to express any complex number. And we refer to this number r as the modulus or kind of the, the length of that complex number from the origin. And then this theta, we would usually just call the phase of the complex number. And so now looking at this condition, we can realize it it's basically stating that the now this thing z dagger z is going to be for simply one dimensional complex numbers z dagger is just the complex conjugate and so this is really just stating now that the the square if you like or the modulus squared of our complex number has to be equal to one and so we know in our exponential notation we're just going to be considering a complex number with modulus of 1 so just simply a number that lies somewhere on our e to the i theta which is now just the unit circle in the complex plane and so this condition is telling us that our modulus has to be 1 and now we can realize that any z which is given in this form is then going to satisfy this condition just really quickly, z bar is going to be e to the minus i theta. And so z bar times z is just going to be 1. And so we've successfully verified now, or just by kind of making a postulate for how we express any arbitrary complex number, we've then showed that this condition can be satisfied now for such an expression. 
And so we can then basically realize that any u1 element, which I'm here calling z, essentially it's just representing the unit sphere of complex, uh, sorry, the unit circle in the complex plane. And we further realize that the, the one dimension or the free parameter of this group is then going to correspond to this theta angle. And so we can realize now all the elements in this group u1, they just lie on the unit circle. So this is now z in u1, simply lying on the unit circle. And we can now take this and understand this to be the definition of any u1 element. Simply just that we express the element in terms of our parameter theta using this kind of complex exponential. Okay, so that's really nice. We've seen that we can represent the one dimensional unitary group in this form. And now we can see that what this means, at least topologically now, is that this group U1 is going to be isomorphic to the circle S1. Since we can identify every point on the circle, i.e. lying on our unit circle, with an element of the group, just through this relation here. And so the group U1, topologically now, is isomorphic to the circle S1. But now if you cast your mind back to when we talked about the special, the two-dimensional orthogonal group, SO2, we also saw that the group SO2 was isomorphic to S1. because we could represent our SO2 transformation as just being some point on this circle. And we, of course, saw that how any points on the circle, they do form a group. You just compose the elements by adding the angles of their arguments together. And so what this is now really telling us is that the group U1 is now isomorphic to the group SO2 or really, these two groups are now both isomorphic to a circle. But this is now giving us some kind of fundamental connection between this U1 group and our SO2 group. If you remember, we simply had that this SO2 group we could parameterize with our theta parameter. And so we can kind of realize the isomorphism as being this exponential map that takes you into the z equals e to the i theta element. So now we can really clearly see this one-dimensional complex group really is just the same group as this SO2 group. And so you'll sometimes hear this U1 referred to as the circle group, and now we can kind of see why, because it's simply just being represented by points on the unit circle. So, just to summarize then, for our one-dimensional unitary group, we saw, just from our general definition now, that this has to be, well, one by one matrices, they're simply just complex numbers. And so any, now, just complex number that satisfies this condition is going to be in our one-dimensional unitary group. And we saw that this condition for just simply numbers now reduces to just the complex conjugate. And so this is now effectively telling us that the, the modulus squared or the kind of length from the origin to our point in the complex plane just has to be one. So we're lying somewhere on the unit circle. And then by using our parameterization for complex numbers in terms of this theta angle, we're able to realize the connection between now this single parameter parameterizing, well this is a single real parameter, and we're effectively using it to parameterize a single complex dimensional object. So this is kind of giving us a two-dimensional real object from a single real parameter. And so just using this now representation of our complex numbers, we were able to realize that any or that the group U1 is now going to be isomorphic to the circle S1. 
and then we were able to make the connection between the groups U1 and SO2 by also further realizing that SO2 is isomorphic to the circle. And we can see the kind of connection is this um, free parameter theta, which just specifies where you are on the circle. And so in the SO2 case, we saw that this theta then parameterized our matrix and so on. And so this single parameter gives us a two-dimensional object. And so this is the one-dimensional unitary group. It's now as a single complex dimensional object isomorphic to a two-dimensional real group. 